Good morning, uh, everybody. So, a small group, so it would be hard for you not to fall asleep, I think. Um, so, let's, let's basically pick off where we started. So, previously, so yesterday, I was considering this problem, Hamiltonian Jn plus G plus Gv, right? And we had a quasi-conserved quantity. Quasi-conserved quantity, which I was calling n hat. And this n hat was basically a small rotation of, uh, of n. Okay? Uh, so, the first thing that I want to do today is just to go a little bit beyond that in a rather trivial way, but, but still very interesting, I think. Extension to multiple charges, and by multiple charges, I, I mean that instead of having such a very special n which had integer spectrum, I now write something that, that I find actually much more natural, that uh, I have an h0 plus gd plus gv, where now the h0 satisfies the condition that it is of course a sum of local terms, as always, and moreover, these local terms mutually commute. So, um, okay, so this is a slight extension of that, and actually it's, it's much less of a change of formalism than you would imagine, because I claim, and I will sort of, it's an exercise that you can do yourself easily, that uh, you can just write this guy as, um, as a, as a sum over such guys which have integer spectrum, right? This is basically, okay, if on site you, you can now have non-integer spectrum, but, but still in this, since you have a finite Hilbert space, you will have something like uh, perhaps two different spacings or three different spacings, okay? So you tear these three spacings apart and you put them into, uh, into different operators which all have separately integer spectrum, right? Um, so this n alpha has a um, spectrum of it is in Z. So again, I will now not go into how you do that. It's just a quick exercise that you must do. And, uh, and it, I will give an example, however. And in the example, it's completely obvious how to do it, actually. No, 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 sorry, index, thanks. Uh, the example will be, of course, that H0 is J, Z, Z, where, as yesterday, that, well, I will write a summation. Plus uh, H, Z, Z. Okay, if, if unless uh, J and H, Z are multiples of each other, this cannot, this does not have uh, integer spectrum, but, but there are clearly two integers in the case, right, in the uh, game, right? So you call this just n1, and this guy you call uh, well, the sum over these guys, right? You call n2, and uh, that's the setup now. Okay. Mm. And, uh, uh, and of course, the D has again, uh, has again to be chosen such that it commutes with all these guys, so D commutes with all these guys, and the part that does not commute is in V, and again, you have to, I mean, this is a, this is a projection, you have to somehow uh, write a general term as a sum of such things, and this I commented on yesterday, and in this case, it's very similar, but, so I will not go into that. Um, and I'm claiming that we can repeat the analysis of yesterday, so repeat, yesterday analysis, which means 
that we find uh, we find a frame rotation, right? A such that Hamiltonian is transformed into a nicer Hamiltonian, which is yes. Here you mean, not sorry, tens, not summed over with with a, with all, ev, all of them. Yes, all of them. Right. So okay, so you could think this is a strong condition, but this is no condition at all. You see, th again, I mean, I have here a general term of which I just asked that it is small, and then I decompose it into a part that uh, that commutes with all of them and a part that does not. Uh, uh, okay. Good. Uh, now I lost a bit what I was about to, to say. Ah, yeah, right. So we have to find an A so that our Hamiltonian is transformed into something nicer. And the key step there was, of course, you, you might be now not, not recognizing it immediately, but the key step there was that we did this. Um, right, divided by, uh, yesterday it was called n. So we were inverting, we were basically inverting the commutator with n. So now, of course, uh, there, there are several n's, right? There is just an a0 now. So, so instead, of, instead of now inverting the commutator with n, I now will have to invert the commutator with a0. Morally. Right? So in general, I will get a, I will get a, a generalization of what is written here, which is very easy to guess. And uh, it will read. So now, h zero is of course the sum of all these different uh, all these different n alphas. And um, so you get here they all commute, right? That's very important. Did I say that they all commute mutually? I hope I did, right? Uh, it's clear in the example. Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, so you have here sum over alpha j alpha. Um, n alpha, so the alpha was down, so let's keep it down, of state eta minus n alpha of state eta prime. Okay, so this is just the straightforward, uh, th this is just doing that, right? Okay, and now you immediately see why there is a difference with yesterday. So yesterday I had here, divide, I was dividing by j times an integer. And the integer was constrained to be non-zero, okay? So, um, mm, so, uh, the, yeah, so nothing could go wrong. This was ba bounded by one over j. But now, of course, these integers here could conspire to make something that is very close to zero. That's the big difference, okay? So now, to bound this guy, right? So, um, so this guy is something like, J alpha, um, let's say n alpha, right? n would be just, so small n would be just the difference of these two, right? And I have to lower bound that, right? So I want a lower bound on this thing. Okay, now you could, th this is something like, uh, like the problem of uh, adding, having some numbers, multiplying them with integers, and trying to get zero, okay? 
well, yeah, that's not something like that. That's exactly that. Now, um, it, you could say this, how good can you uh, approximate this guy, uh, um, the ratio of the, if there were just two J alphas, then this is the question, how good can you approximate the ratio of this with rational numbers? Okay, and this problem has a name. This is the Diophantine problem. And um, if, you, uh, if you analyze this a bit, which I will not do, but it's actually absolutely not hard, then you see that you can, you can find for most for most m tuples of these numbers, you can find a lower bound, which is of the following form. Perhaps I copy it here. Yeah, you will have some number x. And then you can, uh, okay, you, you will not avoid that this becomes very small when you allow these numbers to be large, right? You, you take uh, rational numbers with smaller and smaller denominators, but you can hope that this does not go very Pass to zero, so we write here the norm of this vector n. Now this is a vector, right? The vector of these tuples uh, to the power, um, I think m. Let's call it tau, and tau has to be bigger than m minus one. Yes. Okay, so this is, and this will be my assumption. So this thing here is a die of what is called a die of time condition. And I assume this condition, and again, this, you, you, so that means I say that exists x and a tau such that this is satisfied, and the point is if you draw the j's randomly, uh, let's say from the unit sphere or so, then you can, with probability one, found, find some x that does that, given that you choose the tau not too small. Okay, very good. Mm. Uh, so what do we get from this estimate? We get from this estimate that um, that this guy is smaller than um, you know what? Let me let me not write it so painstakingly. Let me in, immediately write it in the language that I was using yesterday, because of course this here I'm just estimating a local norm of a. Of, uh, of A, right? And here I have the local norm of V. Yes? Absolutely not. Yeah, 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 yeah absolutely right, Abhishek. So, so um, let me... Let's put the J here, which I just now noticed that is missing. And now let's come to your question. So uh, if this is in two, for M is two, right? If this is J space, then indeed uh, all the, the all rational points, right? 2.1, 1.1, and so on, right? Uh, there it will certainly not be satisfied. Right, so the integer points, but also rational points, it will not be satisfied, right? So uh, one, one half, right? One, one third. So actually a lot of points where it's not satisfied, right? But, uh, but with probability one, it is satisfied. Okay, so, so this, this okay. Um, Yeah, so let, but let me comment a bit later, because now it perhaps sounds that anything that I will derive from that will be extremely fragile, right? Because if I move the J's around and I hit one of these points, which are actually lying dense, well, then the story is over, right? So, so I will later comment on why this result is in the end not fragile at all. But, uh, but certainly this estimate is fragile. Okay, so now what do I pay here? I pay here uh, that, right? And what is this? the norm of this vector n, well, let's look at it, right? So how big can that, the, the norm of the vector n is how big I can make these differences? And what determines how big I can make this difference? Well, of course, how large these guys were on, on locally in Hilbert space, right? So if this 
uh, if I had, for example, on each side 100 levels and n could take values between uh, 0 and 100, then those will be pretty large, and then that guy will be pretty large, and then my estimates will be worse. But more importantly, it's the range of these vi's, right? Because this, so this lives on, on let's say, r sides, right? So let's say r is a range of the v, of the v right? The vi's are the local term in V, and by range, I just mean the size of these local terms or the, the size in space that they live in. And so if you, if you allow a larger region, then of course you can, you can by, by summing over all these sides, you can take, make ends that are larger. So somehow, the, the point here is that this is bounded above by some numerical constant times r. Okay? And that r you will pay here, so you will uh, find here r to the tau, okay? Okay, good, and that's how much, how far, sorry, not two, but tau. That's as far as I want to go with these technicalities, because now if you are interested in that, you could look up the estimates of yesterday, and there also at some point I was getting uh, uh, the range, not in this estimate, but basically in uh, in the estimate where I was estimating a commutator. I will not do it again because that would be a bit painful. And now you are just getting an additional, uh, an additional uh, fa fa factor of the range. So as, whereas previously I had, so yesterday, I had a n. Now the n is not referring to the side but to the scale, right? To which ordering, which iteration step. Whereas yesterday I had that this was growing as n factorial, and then of course there was a small parameter, which was yesterday, I guess, uh, g over j, right? Now, I will have, since at each step I'm not just multiplying once with the range, but also a power tau, I will probably get something like um, tau plus one. Right? And this will lead finally, so this sort of was very hard to follow, right? Now, now I, will, I will just, I will not comment on that anymore, but I will just state what is the result then, uh, if you use that. So now you have the, that uh, equilibration time. Oh, well, no, let's, let's first state the, no, the, the resulting norm on the V n star, so re recall v n star, that was the furthest I could go, the smallest I could make my, my term that does not respect the conservation laws. And so instead of now being exponential in the parameters today, it will be a stretched exponential, so I get here, let's see. Um, so now the small parameter is not longer, uh, not longer, uh, mm -hmm. Ah, yeah, it's G, but now I'm not really comparing it to the J's, uh, although I am comparing it to the J's, so, so to something like norm of J, because now there are several, but I now also have to compare it to this X, right? If X is very small, then I will get very bad estimates, so uh, 1 plus 1 over Okay, so this is just a, a, a very schematic form to indicate that j has to be, g has to be small with respect to j, but there is also, x, if x becomes very small, then that also, uh, I messed up because now it's probably here. Right, now it's clear, right? If x is very small, which means that my Diophantine approximation was very bad, sorry, that the Diophantine condition was hard to satisfy, then I get here a large number which plays against me. Yeah, that's how it is. And I put 1 plus 1 over x basically to remind myself, that doesn't matter, that's what you get. And then you have here uh, 1 over tau plus 1. Okay, so you get a stretched exponential here rather than an exponential, and I would say that this 
to my feeling, this reflects reality. This is not a te technical thing. Uh, but okay, I don't know. I don't think anybody saw the stretched exponential in any numerics. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. Right, but x is a completely uncontrolled function of j, right? But it just, as I said, with large probability, it, I can find an x. Okay? Sure. Yeah, they are dense, but they measure zero, right? Is there, yeah, th that's all, that's all there is, right? So if you pit with the uniform measure on the interval a number, it will, with probability one, not be rational. That, that's all the subtlety there is. Th does that answer your question? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Okay, so, uh, <coughs> yes. Yes. <coughs> And if x is small, then you, you were hoping that your small parameter is, j, let's, say, let's say that j was 1, okay? You, you were hoping that your small parameter was g, but now you see that it's actually a bit worse. Your small parameter is, um, with power? Sorry, I mean, is it not, not clear? So, um, so let, let's think, right? So we started out with a small g, right? Good. Now I see that there is here a very small x, which will show up. So perhaps I, I, I should have written it here. It will show up here, right? Together with the g. So you see now that actually you have g over x. So no matter how small your g was, if x was also very small, well, then perhaps you are not in business. Yeah, 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 so 1 plus 1 over x, no, no. ah, yeah, good. So, an application. Application is interesting, though I must say I don't really understand it myself very well. Um, ah, right, so sorry, credit, um, credit, so this, this theorem here, which I'm now not longer writing as a theorem, this, uh, well, except that I think everybody who thought about it knew this, but when it comes to uh, writing it as a theorem on the archive, then uh, these two papers, and, uh, and so, okay, it's independent of each other, and, uh, and yeah, so, so the papers are, have completely different motivation, but this theorem actually appears in both of them more or less in the same form. That's why I think it's interesting, to, important to say that. The application uh, is uh, precisely the thing that I have, right? So you have the Hamiltonian, which is JZZ plus HZZ plus HXX, right? And you assume that your Diophantine condition is good for J and HZ. So you say an HX is small, right? So HX smaller than no, j z and j j h z diophantine diophantine then you have here two conservation laws so both z z and the magnetization are conserved. Okay, so now you can play games with that, and the games that you can play with that is sort of are precisely the ones that uh, Sarang, uh, who is not here, um, that Sarang uh, did in his talk, right? So there he had, so he had pictures of the following type. So you you were you had down spins, and then you had a domain of up spins. Right? And then he was saying, well, look, uh, in his model, there were exact conservation laws, right? So there was, uh, magnetization was conserved, and then as Sarang tried to explain me, but without much success, from integrability, one sees that there is also uh, this guy, a dressed version of this guy is conserved. 
Okay, so it's a bit the same, the same situation as here. And then you see that the only thing that is allowed for this domain under these constraints is just that it moves, right? So the only allowed move is that the uh, thing moves. Right, so moving there. However, if you think how that has to go, if this has length, length L, um, you see, let's think, what, what is the, the Hamiltonian that, that governs the evolution of that? Well, it's of course the, the Hamiltonian. So let me use the same notation as yesterday where H, no, uh, uh, will I use the same notation as today? I even use H hat. Um, so let me not use H hat. Let me say that there is an, so let's call it ZZ hat, which is a dressed version of ZZ plus HZ Z hat plus D hat, right? Plus something very small, which I will disregard for this discussion because that's, of course, this. It's, exponentially or quasi-exponentially small term. I don't want to be speaking about that. And the d hat commutes with z hat, and the d hat commutes with z z hat. Right, so that's already what I said. So, so the, the only moves that are allowed is shifting that, but, um, well, okay, d is also a sum of local terms, and you, if you want a local term, that does this shift, that's clearly a local term that has to be acting on that stretch of side, right? Because you cannot just shift it by acting locally here. Okay, so, mm, so only terms of range bigger than L shifts the domain. Right, now I did not, in my estimates, I did not keep track of how small the terms of big range are in D, in D hat, but it's sort of obvious. I mean, I started out with something local, then I added something that is a little bit less local but was smaller and so on and so on. So it's quite, uh, I think it's quite easy to believe that uh, these terms have size, such terms, have local norm of order um, G, but it's, you know, it's not G, it's actually, it's of course this thing, right? This whole thing that I could call one over epsilon, and I should have called that one over epsilon. So epsilon to the L, okay? Which is what Saran also said, right? That, that these, the, the lone dies move very, heavy, very slowly, okay? So that's, uh, that's, I would say, an obvious uh, consequence. Now, it becomes a bit more interesting um, if you take, for example, a domain wall. So, this thing here, right? Now, <laughs> The sort of, it's a little bit different, right? Now, strictly speaking, there is just no move you can do. So this thing would be stuck. So this is uh, stuck for time, well, the time that is basically uh, exponential in this, in this thing, right? So this is extremely suppressed. Right. Mm. The, the reason that I, that I find that actually interesting is that there was a paper uh, a few months ago on the, uh, well, no, not on the archive, published by, by these authors that, uh, that make, uh, that um, do numerics on this thing, and they see indeed a huge suppression of the energy current. So, exactly in such a setup. So that sounds, of course, at first sight, very nice, right? Um, 
because, because it just fits very well in my theory. If you think further about it, I actually come to the conclusion that I don't understand it. Because, of course, these guys prepare this domain wall in the, in the natural spins, whereas this thing has all these conservation laws in the dressed spins. Right? So, okay, so what, what according to me you have to do, but perhaps I'm missing something to analyze this thing, is of course to go to the basis of dressed spins. And in the basis of dressed spins, the picture changes slightly. Right? So, so, of course, most spins are here still up, but every now and then, you, you basically will have a low density gas of down spins. And here you will have a low density gas of up spins. Right? Sometimes, sometimes a doublon. Right? And then it seems to me that, uh, that actually exactly as Saran explained us, okay, so of course transport will be slow because these downspins are rare, but, but not so rare. They are just basically one over epsilon. Uh, sorry, epsilon rare. The density is epsilon. And such a guy can move freely. And such a guy can, just as Saran explained us, uh, attach to the boundary. The boundary shifts a bit and it continues as a magnon of opposite sign. So, this guy is going in that direction, and then uh, at the other side, it continues as an up spin. Okay? But this, according to me, trans, uh, transfers energy, so, so, so after all, I perhaps don't really understand that. Uh, yes? Uh, no, 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 there is no HZC Hamiltonian there. I was just referring to the thought by Sarang. That's why you speak about HZC, right? There, the conservation laws were exact, right? So that's a different business. Here, the, the conservation laws are, of course, approximate, but um, mm, yeah, so approximate, that's the Hamiltonian. So, sorry, 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 what am I saying? Yeah, yeah, I did not even write the Hamiltonian. Uh, so. So that's the Hamiltonian, right? Yes, yes. And so, uh, okay, so I'm confused about that, but... Uh, mm, and then... Right, so let me now say, but without writing it, because that would become too complicated, let me say something about this fragile condition. So... First of all, you, you might, okay, you, if you, um, let's say that, well, actually, let's stay with this here. So let's say that at some point, the Diophantine condition for J and HZ becomes very bad or even not valid because HZ is small. Well, then you still have the option of just using the theorem with that being part of the perturbation. That's okay, right? That can still be done. Um, and actually, actually, a lot of, some of the phenomenology of that is, or, or, or at least of that, is rather in that regime. But okay, that's, let me not discuss that. So that's one thing. That's, so that's why you are not immediately dead. Then let's say that HZ is not small, but it's really one half of J. Okay, but if it's one half of J, then you can, then you can put them together, and then together they have integer spectrum. Right? So then you can make a theorem for that. So you are sort of never completely dead. And that's, I think, why in practice, you, you certainly don't see in numerics any chaotic dependence on the J. Right? Even if the theorem, the applicability of the theorem, does have a chaotic dependence on the, on the J. That's what, that was your question. I don't know whether it's answered by, yes? Yes? Say it once more. It's Indeed, it's not possible. Yes, so, okay, so, fine. So, um, so, uh, so apart from the, from the applicability to the theorem, right, which I discussed, let's now also say what happens if you have, a, a, in principle, a rational number, but it's in, actually, it's a ra sorry. You have in principle an irrational number, but in practice it's approximated by a rational number with very high, with very large denominators. Okay, so then this will fail, but of course to see that failure, 
you will have to go to very large norm of n. Very large norm of n here means very large range. Very large range here means very large order of iteration or order of the perturbation steps. So then indeed, in the computer you would never strictly see an exponential, but you might see a hundred power, right? Could be much okay. That's another reason why the result is of course much more robust than, than this uh, indicates. Good. Um, so I, I think the conclusion of that discussion was, uh, so I'm sure some of you understand that and just explain it to me later. Uh, I'm not fully understanding that. Um, good. So now I think we have finished this part, and I want to say something about periodic driving. Okay, so. High frequency. Yeah, so the setup is that we have, of course, a periodic Hamiltonian. Right, time periodic. And I will be in the high frequency regime, which will mean for me that the period times the local norm of, uh, of this H, which I will basically call G, just as previously, that this guy is much smaller than one. That's the high frequency regime. Okay. And we will, uh, we will aim to get a quasi-conserved quantity. Aim to get quasi-conserved. Uh, let's, let's call it charge to, to, to celebrate that there are so many integrability people here. Um, right, and what the result will be, um, Result will be basically that your propagator UT, right, which a priori is of course the time integrated, uh, well, the time ordered exponential of, of this H, right, I'm writing it a bit schematically, hope that's okay, that this guy can actually be cast as the time ordered exponential of, uh, of another guy, which is, aha, so now it's a problem that I did not put the T here. Uh, of course, it should not be a T, it should be an S, the S, zero to T, zero to T. Um, it's a static guy, which will be called, uh, uh, which will be called, um, Aha, it's called D here, that's a problem. Why is it called D? Uh, okay, let's call it D. Um, trying to be consistent with yesterday's lecture, that's why I'm thinking how this, what is the analog of that? Yes, the analog is D hat. Good, plus, uh, plus something that is very small, so I will just now write small. Okay, it will always be exponentially small. Um, and this will be true in a rotated frame. Okay, so I, with the frame rotation um, such that at, at 
multiples of the period at stroboscopic times, this is simply one. Stroboscopic times. Okay, so I have the evolution. It's given by a time-dependent Hamiltonian, and by going to another frame here, I write it as the evolution by a time-independent Hamiltonian plus very small, again, exponentially small corrections. Okay, so that will be the result, just to, that there will be no surprising surprises. And this implies consequence is, of course, that... Um, that this guy is a quasi-conserved quantity. It's also called sometimes an effective Hamiltonian, so perhaps I should have called it an effective Hamiltonian. Um, is quasi-conserved. Well, it's obvious, right? If, if you just take, uh, so, uh, just take this guy, and then do the time evolution with um, at stroboscopic time, so T times N, N star, right? At stroboscopic time, this thing is one, so this vanishes, and this thing is very small, so it's obvious that this minus that, right, is in local norm, very small, because the, the, the violation of this being zero just comes from that small term, and so perhaps at this point I write how small it is. So this would be, um, this would be exponential minus one over Tg, right? That was my small parameter. Uh, yes, so this is large, so it's okay. And that, but it, of course, grows in time, right? So times Tn. Right? So this thing will, of course, grow in time. At some point, it will be over. But you see now that, uh, that the, the tree factor is so small that you need to time. So T times N would be the physical time that is itself exponentially small. Okay, so this is, and I could now make all the pictures again, right? This will lead to pre-thermalization. just for the same reasons as yesterday, because before you reach that time, you are basically doing time evolution with the d hat. And the d hat, that might be a very jolly fellow that, that thermalizes to some state and so on, right? There is nothing that, here there is nothing special about d hat. Okay, d hat is, uh, could be perfectly ergodic and it will in general be ergodic because there are so many non-local terms added to it. So it would have to be a miracle if that, were in, if the d hat itself were integrable. Good. Mm, yes. Say it once more. The small. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. So small. Okay. So you know, write it as v hat over t. Then it's the same as yesterday, and it's yeah. Yeah, yeah. But the unitary that is that you see, it, if it were any unitary, then this would buy you nothing. Because that unitary could be itself time evolution of some chaotic Hamiltonian or so, but it's, it's a special time unitary. It's one that at all stroboscopic times comes back to one. It's, yeah, so in the steady state, you will see what people call a micro motion, right, which is due to that unitary. But, but you see, it's sort of, anyhow, the, it, it, it's, it's, it's basically the exponential of a Hamiltonian that is of order gt, right? Sorry, of order g, and you apply it for maximal time t, because then you are back at 1. So you don't go far with this Hamiltonian, right? You're just oscillating. Okay? Good. Uh, okay, so... Okay, so this question, I, I, just, I had just decided to skip that, but since you ask, so you could, of course, do uh, you could do the following. What about the logarithm of u t one over t? Right, that would be what you called in the Floquet Hamiltonian. Well, 
So it's a, it's a little, in some sense it is close, right? Because if you take, if you put that zero, well then, if you, if you pretend that this is really zero, then this guy is of course a logarithm of that, clear. But the point is that in general, right, unless there is something very special that we did not assume, this thing, this logarithm will be an extremely non-local operator that is not good for anything, okay? Whereas the D is good for you because it's a sum of local terms. But still, some people like to say that D is an approximation to this Lotia Hamilton, and strictly speaking, these claims make no sense. I mean, not that anybody gets that. I'm just saying, saying it like that is sort of obscuring the picture. So. I, your first word I missed. Yes? Sure. Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah, that's, that's right. So, okay, so let me, let me phrase what you said in, in a more general framework. So, um, you are saying, well, in some, yeah, so, if you wait long enough, right, then this guy will win, and then you will heat up, because there is not longer a, some, a local term that is constraining you, right? And then, indeed, you could say, well, then the only conservation law that you still have would be the real Flotier Hamiltonian, which is non-local, which tells you nothing. So, in this sense, that's all consistent, right? Yeah. In the VT, you mean? Yeah, 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 yeah. So, right, so, okay. So when I said, that, as yesterday, this statement, right, that the, um, that the local norm of this guy is like, uh, is like that, right? It was supposed to, it was a little bit vague, but it was saying, right, this is a sum of local terms, and the, um, and the local terms, um, they, they have some range, which we are usually not writing, and, and that's it. And they have a size, which is that. Okay, so now, in this case, they will, I, so you see, I stopped at a finite order, right, which was, uh, diverging with when G goes slow, but it's still a finite order, and this finite order is basically, uh, is basically, uh, so I think the, the, the range will be something like logarithm of this number, okay? So it's getting more and more non-local, but rather slowly, and that's, yeah. Make sense? Sorry, I, I said that wrongly. Sorry, it's it stays like GT, like one over GT, not logarithm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good. So now, um, since we did yesterday all this technical work, we can perhaps. Time. Uh, Why? Yeah, I still have half an hour. That's very good. Um, we can still perhaps do a little bit of uh, of this. Um, so. So now the proof, but I will very much simplify it, just a very brief proof. So you are solving this equation. Right, for some state. This is the Schrodinger equation, and as yesterday I will try to find the convenient frame rotation, so I put here an A, E, that will generate my frame rotation. Right, and then I put it here so I can remove it here. Then, for convenience, I put it back here. Okay, and so now you look at this guy, and you say, well, let's try to choose AT such that this guy has a smaller time-dependent term. Okay? And, um, okay, so... Let's, let's just do it, right? So let's just try to calculate this and expand it in powers of AT, and I will now go very quickly. So, this guy is up to higher order terms, which can then be handled, is, uh, of course, this derivative is remaining there, you get something like uh, I uh, that, the time derivative of A, you get, um, let's see, you, mu you must get the first, the zeroth order term, which was just HT itself. 
perhaps I will drop the T's because everything depends in a periodic fashion on T, so I drop the T's. Um, and then there are higher orders. Everything else is higher order, so everything else will be manifestly of order. Um, <laughs> G squared T. Okay, so, so the point is, but, but this guy is of order G, and I want to make it smaller, and there is just one thing I can do. I can uh, try to solve this equation, to put that to zero, and that's, of course, very easy to make that zero. Why is that very easy? Because you just say, oh, let's AT, let that be the time integral of this H, right? Um, is it, there is just one thing that I now swept a bit under the rug, and that is that, of course, I want the AT to be time periodic, because as said, if the AT is not time periodic, this frame rotation will not be time periodic. And if this frame rotation is not time periodic, then, then I get nothing from this statement. It might still be true, but I get absolutely nothing from it because this would be then something like evolution with the Hamiltonian for a long time t or something like that. Well, could do anything. So I want A to be time periodic, so I basically say let's try to make this true, right? And if you uh, defined A by this condition, then that means that the time average So this requires that the time average of dth t is zero, right? Which, of course, is not always the case, right? So what do you have to do? The same as previously. Previously, I had to split my perturbation in a part that commuted with n and a part that does not commute with n. I have to do now the same. So this is nonsense, but I can write h t s D, e, uh, no, D time independent plus VT, where I, of course, now define as D as the time average. And V as the rest, and now the rest has the nice property that its time average is zero, right? So now you, you don't really do that, so this was not a good idea. Not a good idea, because this was not satisfied, but now you replace it by, by V, V S, which has this property, and then we are very happy. Okay, good. So, um, and that's how you proceed, and actually this analysis is very similar to the one before, and actually, which perhaps I should have told you, but I will now not elaborate on it. It's the same analysis because the problem of yesterday can be mapped into, the pro into this problem by, doing, uh, uh, by going to an interaction picture, so, uh, by going to a rotating frame. But I will not elaborate on that. Mm, good. Uh -huh. Perhaps one thing, why is this AT small? Well, because you integrate for a time which is small. So AT, the local norm of the of that local norm is, well, t, because this time is maximally t, and then you have the local norm of, actually, of v, which was g, right? And uh, my assumption was that t times g is very small, so this is indeed very small. v is very small, and so we are in business. And now the the then runs in the same way as yesterday, and so I will not comment on that. So again, this of course, it's very, it's, it's very weird to speak about it and not use the word Magnus expansion, so that's why I'm using it now. So there is something that all of you know, which is the Magnus expansion, which sort of approaches this problem in a seemingly different, but eventually very similar way, namely to, um, to uh, try to calculate this logarithm by some expansion and then try to create at some order, okay? And this is just, okay, another way to do it, which is more control and actually gives you a slightly stronger result. Uh, it's, it's quite difficult to estimate the terms in this Magnus expansion. So, um, I should say, so this is, of course, from our paper that I'm telling it, but at the same time, 
there were uh, there was uh, uh, these guys who have been I think they are now gone right but they all of them were here um, and they did uh, this almost the same well it's not quite the same but a very similar result they also controlled rigorously this uh, heating time good um, what could we say about that um, yes quasi-crystals. That will be an application of, of uh, this story. Mm, I, I have not written any reference for quasi-crystals because... Uh, oh, sorry, yes, sure. Yeah, it starts to show that I did not sleep much. Time crystals, yes. Uh, and they are pre-thermal. Right, so I did. I do have one reference about pre-thermal time crystals, which is uh, these guys. I, did those, I think they were the first to use the word pre-thermal time crystals, and well, I think what they did is must be more or less what I'm writing here. But but this has been, but it's treated by so many people that by now I find it hard to associate it to anybody. Um, so. So the model is, uh, is again t-periodic, but now I will write a rather specific form. My, my uh, one cycle operator, the ut, will be, so it starts off in the very same way, exponential of time evolution of uh, a local Hamiltonian. That will again be considered to be small. So in some sense, we will still be in the, in the uh, high frequency regime. Namely, this guy, it right, will be Ej, that is much, much smaller than one. But now you put something that is not small at all. Now I will put here the flip operator, and the flip operator is just exponential of um, pi over 2 j it's j. So you see, the, this operator flips all the spits in z basis, right? So oh, it just flips everybody. Okay. Now, um, I guess that two remarks are in order here. Um, so first, it's something that I already said in words. This is not loner in the high frequency regime, right? So this guy is in the high frequency regime, but, but this not, okay? It's not that the time, tau over two times the local norm of that, which is one, is not small. So this is not high frequency. And the second thing, and that's just not to get confused with what is often being said about this. So people often emphasize that the time crystal, and I emphasized yesterday as well, that everything that we discuss has to be somehow robust. And the way I've written here does not seem very robust because I've constrained this flip to be exactly that, right? But of course, if you instead have, instead of f, you would have f epsilon, which would be, exponential of i pi over 2 plus epsilon, it's j, right? Then um, you, um, uh, then it's, it still fits this framework because I did not put any constraints on this except that it's small. So now you, this you can of course split as the fl original flip times i epsilon, just write it as x, and now this guy can be added to that. You just made this, this time evolution, you made a little space by extending t to t plus epsilon, and you include that guy there. Okay, so I'm just to, stay, to state that this model is not fine-tuned, okay? So this is, so I have...
not fine tune. Okay, very good. So, uh, what will we do with this? Now, treatment of this model. Okay. Um, so, first remark is if I look at u square t, right, which is um, which is the following. So it's it's that, and then again that, right? Just the square. Well, then you can sort of do a trick, right? You can you have f exponential of Hamiltonian, f exponential of a Hamiltonian, and it happens even to be the same Hamiltonian. And so now you can say, well, this I can write in a simpler way. Okay, so this is expo time ordered exponential of something that I will now call perhaps h tilde to differentiate it from, from the original h, and that goes up to time 2t, and the h tilde would be, of course, h t if t is in the first period, and, uh, and it would be f h t, uh, f h t plus t if uh, if we are in the second period, so sorry, I'm, I'm not writing very nicely here. Uh, uh, and then, of course, I, sorry, I mean t minus a p. Okay? So that's just by putting these two things together. Good? Fine. So now, uh -huh, now something beautiful happens. Uh, this, all these terms were of order g, and g times t was very small, so let's be generous and say that g times 2t is also very small, so now I am still in the high frequency regime, so if g times 2t is very small, right, we can have high frequency expansion. Okay, so, um, so that means that u square e is written now as, and now I will drop the error term, okay? I will just write um, 2 i 2 t with a certain d, d hat. Okay, so let, let me put a wiggle saying that I drop, I drop the, the very small error term because now it's not, not longer about bounds. The bounds will be trivial just as before, but now it's about interpreting what happens with that. Okay, now having this already tells me something. It tells me that at, at not at stroboscopic times, we don't yet know what happens at stroboscopic times, but at even stroboscopic times, I just have evolution with some uh, effective Hamiltonian. Fine. Um, so that could make you think that the, there is nothing happening more than in the high frequency regime, but that is wrong. Makes a bit more space. Right, so let's actually think a little bit how we would start doing this high frequency expansion. So time ordered exponential of our Hamiltonian at uh, h tilde, right? With the h tilde, again, I mean, let's just write it schematically, 0 t, 2 t. So the, this point is related to that point by the flip. Right? So, uh, still the, uh, let me just write it like that. Perhaps that's much better, right? Uh, t plus t is h tilde t 
with a flip. Good, so what does that mean? Well, the first thing that we have to do, we always have to calculate the mean thing, right? Because remember, sorry, the time average. We always have to subtract the time average, okay? So that guy, that's very easy, right? So that will be dt h tilde t. Put perhaps the 2t here, plus, plus the same thing over this period, but that is just the original one conjugated by f. So I can put this f outside. This guy here, right, so, so the D has some special structure, right, because of the F. And the special structure namely is that, that D, if you, con if you flip it, you get back D, well, right? Because if you apply the flip, well, this guy becomes that, and here the flip two times is of course one, right? So perhaps I should have emphasized that much more, flip square is one. Okay, so you have this property of the D. Okay, and then there is of course a V, right? So then, so I will have D plus V T, and then I switch on the machine, which actually I did not explain for the periodic driving, but it's the same machine as yesterday, as I told you, and then you get D N plus V and T and a little bit of inspection that I will now skip because I don't think it's good for the blackboard will show you that you will keep having this structure. So the DN will always have the symmetry. And so in particular at the very end of the story, uh, so at some point I will take N equal to N star, right? And, and uh, then I call it uh, D hat, right? Sorry, that, that was a bit not very pedagogical what I'm doing now. And star, and also this guy, then of course, obviously has this symmetry. Okay, now why is that so fantastic? So, why, as uh, Vedika likes to point out, why did time crystals make it to this beautiful uh, front page of? Uh, what was it, uh, science magazine or, or even time? I now don't know anymore. Um, it's because of the following property. Mm. So let's assume now, let's assume that the initial state has F spontaneous symmetry breaking, right? So that uh, so, so you basically have to be in the ground state or in higher dimension. So the, the symmetry, the flip symmetry is spontaneously broken in uh, the state that we start with. Okay, fine. So the order parameter here is Z for that symmetry, right? And as already said at the, so this is, 2t, this is 4t, those are the even stroboscopic times. At the even stroboscopic times, we are basically evolving with, um, with 2n t d hat, right? So we had this symmetry broken state, well, they were just, just I mean, continuing with that Hamiltonian, so we, we keep that state, right? So you will have, is here, right? So actually, perhaps I was a little bit sloppy here. So you just, okay, so sorry, let me say that again so that it sounds less mysterious. We are in two dimensions. The, this flip symmetry is uh, spontaneously broken and, um, and I start out with a system that has low energy density. It will, of course, relax to one of the symmetry broken states, right? So let's say that originally it was here. But of course, since this Hamiltonian is thermalizing, it is relaxing to the symmetry broken state. Okay? Because those are the deep states at that energy density, fine. Very good. So, so there is of course an initial, again, a, a pre-thermalization plateau. It's now discrete points. But now what happens at the, at the old 
stroboscopic times? Well, uh, let's see. Mm. So then I have to ask myself, um, what happens? Right, what happens here? So mm. to n plus one d h e, right? Well. What can I do? I can, I can, of course, split this as evolving first up to the closest, the nearest by even stroboscopic time and then doing the rest. But for the even stroboscopic time, I have all these results here, right? So I know that this will be E I um, 2 N T D hat, right? Because D hat evolves between the even stroboscopic time and okay, then I have still uh, a little bit of thing to do, then I have to um, right, sorry guys, I messed this a bit up. This is sorry. Um, why did I mess up? This was just a sorry, let me let me just shortcut it. So this was just a time propagator u up to two n plus one t. And of course, the whole assumption was that it's not written as the time ordered exponential of Hamiltonians because it's with the flips in between. It just for ha in ha integer uh, times, integer periods that I had, that I could rewrite it really as the exponential of a Hamiltonian. And then, of course, I still have the part left corresponding to one period. And the part corresponding to one period is, of course, the thing that I started with, exactly that. So let's just write that, okay? So there is here a time ordered exponential of something that is basically, uh, let me write it schematically, order G, right? So this will be something small, right? And then there is this flip. That's all I need. So what, what happens now at this time? Well, we time evolve with uh, this guy, which does nothing, which keeps my order parameter at its value, right? Because it's the static Hamiltonian of which this deep state, of which this state is a deep state, right? And then I evolve with something that is small for one time period. So that's just a small thing, right? So this is just a, a quasi-local unitary close to one, right? It's close to one. It's not really one, right? It can rotate all the spins by an amount gt, but the whole assumption is that that is small. And then I flip them. Oh, okay. So uh, basically I, I can, let's say, made the, um, the magnetization a little bit smaller. So let, let's write it, one plus order GT, right? So of course not in Hilbert, that's of course not a good expansion as an operator, right? That's just schemat schematically. So I can rotate the spins by order GT, and then I flip. Very good, but that means that I have to end up something somewhere which is in, in absolute value close to this order parameter, right? So, uh, and that is impossible because I have no space on the picture, so that is very bad organization. So then I assume that this is a little bit bigger and I can put it here, right? Because that's exactly this point minus a little bit of error, okay? So this, that I can be gone, can go now. So this would be minus this initial value, this be the initial value, or, or, or this, this equilibrium value, yeah, very better, the equilibrium value. And then this error is of order gt, okay? But, and you could think, oh, it will draw with every period, but it will not draw with every period because, so here it is here, and to calculate it at time 90, I will of course not, not try to start from this, but I will start from here where it was nearly perfect, so, well, perfect, equal to that, and so I will keep here. Okay, and that is this famous time crystal, right? Because you see now that it's, okay. It's a time signal with period 2t, and there is an emergent, so time translation symmetry is broken, as people like to say, and there is an emergent spatial symmetry, namely uh, effectuated by the spin flip. Okay. Yes.
Yes. Epsilon is not zero. I mean, that was the whole point of this comment, right? That, so I write it as this, which suggests a little bit that it's fine-tuned, but it's not because epsilon is not zero. Then this thing, you just shove it into that, and that was arbitrary, right? Right, so, so to get all this thing, I did not use any special property of that, except that it's small, okay? So now I have 10 minutes or so, or even less, to come to the main part of this talk. Sure, that will work extremely well. Yes. Uh, yeah, yeah, nine minutes, okay. So, um, periodic driving beyond high frequency. Driving uh, beyond uh, T. Oh, oh, sorry, beyond uh, high frequency. Not those symbols here. So, what is the model? I have an HT which is periodic. And it will not be high frequency, but it will have this, the following special structure, which, which combines a bit the previous two parts of the talk. There is an N operator, so that's the same beautiful N operator as yesterday and, and today, plus GDT, plus GVT, and by now you know the drill, right? So you know that this guy commutes with that, and this guy does not, and even a bit stronger, has this property. Uh, that we mentioned yesterday, and the regime is the regime is still that GT is much smaller than one, so that's why I did not want to write it. So that's that sounds like the same condition as before, but it's now I mean it now has a different meaning because not all terms in the Hamiltonian are small, so this is not high frequency. Okay, now um, let me jump immediately to the point, what is the analysis of this model? Uh, actually, before I tell you what is the analysis, perhaps let's see what is the aim. The aim is that I again have a quasi-conserved quantity, and it's this n. n quasi-conserved. Okay? And why is n quasi-conserved? Well, you could, so this guy conserves it, this guy not, and you could, well, if this guy were static, then the analysis of yesterday would apply, but this guy is time dependent, actually everything here is time dependent, so you could think, oh, perhaps I can change n by absorbing and emitting photons, right? So here is the axis of the photon energies, right? Uh, omega, sorry, omega is of course 2 pi over t, and I want to uh, destroy the conservation of that, so I have to create one of these particles, so let's say bar is simply the time average of this thing, right? And now I will play the following game. So I will some sort of have to be on resonance while emitting photons and absorbing quanta of this, of this N field. Well, and sort of, if they are sufficiently incommensurate, then this will be very hard. The way I draw it here, this is actually very small, but perhaps, perhaps J is very small, so this is actually not close enough. And now you see that, well, you might be in business if J and omega are not commensurate, so I mean, you are surely not in business if J is exactly equal to omega, or if J is two times omega, but if they are sufficiently incommensurate, then yes, and here again there will be a Diophantine condition, which I will now not write, but I will just state it, 
die of runtime, addition on, um, on the pair of numbers j bar 2 pi over t. Very good. Mm. And so I will basically combine the analysis of yesterday and the analysis of today and do absolutely the same thing, but it's a little bit different, but I will not tell you about that. So there will be an analysis and then there is a result. And the result is that the time propagator, ut, is, there will be again a frame rotation. So this guy satisfies uh, t z equal to one, right? And then there will be here a Hamiltonian. And let's see what it will be. It will first of all keep the, the n quantity. So that will still be there. Then it will keep the d quantity. Well, sorry, it will of course be a renormalized thing. So I will now write it again as d hat. Um, and this guy will also be time dependent. And then, as always, there will be something very small. So, so this will be the V. Okay, and what is special about the D, not that it's static, but the special thing about the D is that it commutes with the N. And of course, the n is itself a sum of mutually commuting terms with integer spectrum, right? It's the same as yesterday. So that is special, and then of course, that the v is very small. Total norm of that guy uh, will be expo stretched exponentially in some epsilon, and uh, the stretching here will be, I think in this case, I can prove basically 3 plus some delta. Um, and the epsilon is basically gt, but just as in my previous, just as in the case that I discussed today with several n's, uh, there will be a, there will be a leftover from the Diophantine condition. So I will have to add one over x, and the x comes from the Diophantine condition, right? So just as previously, there will be a thing that quantifies how good or how badly I satisfy this Diophantine condition. Okay. Um, so what do I need to tell you about that? Well, that, of course, a con it's clear that a conclusion of that is that indeed N is quasi-conserved, right? N is quasi-conserved. Well, because it commutes obviously with that, and it commutes with that, and that guy is very small. So that conclusion remains the same. Um, what else to tell you about it? Yeah, uh, I will tell the, the next thing I will say in words. You might feel that there is okay. We we have this Diophantine condition. That there is this problem has everything to do with quasi periodic driving, even though it's formulated as periodic driving. So you could. Um, easily go to a rotating frame where to the interaction picture with respect to this guy, then you will get rid of this guy at the cost of getting an extra time dependence here with frequency set by, by this number. And then there will be two frequencies in the game, so that's a price to pay, will not longer be periodic, there will be two frequencies. The gain will be that everything what remains here is now small. So you are back in a high frequency regime, but with quasi-periodic driving. And that's exactly what this paper that, that has the same basic, very similar results to what I'm discussing has. So that Elza Ho and Dumitrescu did exactly that point of view. And they got actually beautiful stuff out of that, but that's not what I am doing here. Okay, so that was just a remark, right? That you can have a completely different picture of that. And that becomes important if you actually want to describe what this would pre-terminalize to. Because you see, I don't see, even not in the simplest cases that I will be discussing, why this guy would have um, a floquet generator. So why this guy would have an effective Hamiltonian, right? 
of course, it could be for some special choices of models, but in general, I certainly don't see it. Um, so I thought, the previous time I gave this thought, I thought that what would happen is, oh, well, you are constrained by n, but further no constraints, so we will relax to a featureless state governed by a constraint on n. But actually, these authors pointed out that that's not what happens, that something much nicer happens, that actually, you, upon going to a quasi-periodic rotating frame, you do have an effective Hamiltonian, right? So, so that this featureless state is not featureless, there is again an effective Hamiltonian, it's just not periodic, but quasi-periodic, fine. Um, and now my time is up, so, um, so let's see, what can I say in 30 seconds? Yeah, so I will take 30 seconds. Is it okay? So I was basically motivated by the work by uh, Prozen, Polkovnikov, Vaina, and Klobaj that is there, and that in turn I think was largely motivated by um, work by Prozen of uh, more than 10 years ago where he considers the following model. So it's jxx plus hxx, it's just the same model as before, but with uh, the role of x and z uh, interchanged. And then he is plotting basically regions of very slow thermalization for that model. And um, I'm, I'm now just copying from, from the, uh, one of the last papers that is there. So if you make a diagram, phase diagram, in terms of hx and hz, then you see the following picture. So there is this is sorry. I, this is of course the variable on these axes, and and these special points are pi over two, pi over two. And uh, the the r the region which is not colored is the region where the the thermalization rate is smaller than 10 to the minus s, uh, sorry, uh, 1 over 1 million, numerically, right? Okay, you would have to argue what do you mean by thermalization rate, but that's what, what Prozen finds in this numerics. And uh, so by this theorem, uh, aha, and so, sorry, sorry, I'm, I'm completely messing up. Uh, that means that it's time to stop that. It's not a Hamiltonian, but it's of course a kit system. Sorry. So it's AX plus AZ Z minus IJ XX. Okay? So not the Hamiltonian, but uh, the kit stuff. Um, and so the thermalization rate meaning towards the featureless te infinite temperature state. So this thermalization rate is very small, and let's briefly see whether we understand that. So do we understand why it's small here? Well, here that means this region is characterized by small hz, right? Uh, small hz, if I delete that, oh, then I have basically uh, xx and x. This is not one n, but two n's. So this theorem does not strictly speaking apply, but you can just make a version with two n, so that does apply. So this is covered. Then uh, what are the other regions that are covered? This thing here is covered more trivially. You can just put both of these small, then it's trivially covered. This thing is covered by considering the time crystal case. So you see, you just, instead of considering one unitary, you consider two unitaries of that kind. And then you see that it's again, upon doing that, it's again of this form. That's covered. And actually, I want to point out that here, in this region, there is no slow thermalization. Why is there in this region no slow thermalization? Well, this region here is h, it's small. If h, h, h is small, then it's not that the model does not any, have any special features. It actually becomes z and x, x. Well, that smells like free fermions. So this if you put h x to zero, then this is treatable by Jordan Wigner, and you have free fermions. But, and that's, I come now to the main point of my lectures, basically. Free fermions is also an integrable system, but not a sum of local commuting terms. So there, there is not this exponentially slow pre-thermalization. There is just fermi golden rule, and indeed, you see no slow thermalization here. Um, and that's the very last thing that I'm saying. Um, 
this thing, so you, you see, I, I have reproduced the picture a little bit on scale, right? So this number here is, I don't know what, is one half or so, right? So the, he can, apparently the parameters can be pretty large, whereas my theorem needs them enormously slow. So as, as uh, Maxim pointed out yesterday, or I mean, it could be that we are, so, or I am simply missing the point, right? That this does not explain any of the numerics. Okay, but it at least uh, gives an indication, I hope. Okay, that's all. Yes. I'm Crystal, or would like, would you need like something like a spatial temporal order? Yeah, but there was spatial temporal temporal order, no? Yeah, like something like an out of time order correlator. Something like what? Out of time order correlator. Ah, you mean that I you want me to define a correlation function and uh, yeah, let's yeah, fine. So correlation function of z at time zero and spatial point and origin, and then z at time um, two. Um, at a space point far away from zero, and time uh, two times uh, the pe I mean even period times. That would be one, right? Whereas if I take half uh, uh, odd period times, it would go to minus one. Does that make sense? I don't know whether this is the definition, but this would certainly be a characterization of the phenomenon with the property with the uh, ingredients that you demanded. Other questions? I don't know if this is just a notation issue, but um, in the last theorem that you have uh, there on the board, so we have n and not n hat, which kind of suggests that there is no dressing of the n. Oh. Can you mm. comment, like, is the end there meant to be the dress? End? No, no, no. So I, did I mess up that far? Yeah, yeah, it may, indeed. It's sort of very weird to have the hat on one thing and not on the other thing. But I mean, uh, just the question is, is this- No, no, there is nothing or? going on. No, no. So there is nothing special here, right? So the, the, the quasi-conserved quantity in the original frame is, of course, is, of course, a dressed one. Sure. So, I had, so what was the shaded region actually in the phase two? The shaded region. The shaded region is where the thermalization rate is not smaller than one over one million. Well, fa <laughs> okay, fast, but yeah, fast. Then what, what's the the white region? The the the, uh, the boundary. The ah, what is the boundary of this curve? Uh, no, the entire thing. This thing. This. What is that? The out, outermost car. So, sorry, so, so I have, wait, What's so I have diagram, like? drawn a quarter circle, and this qu I, then I have a subset of the quarter circle which is shaded, and I have the complement of that subset. So the subset of the circle is fast thermalization, the complement is slow thermalization. And uh, so just to make sure the time crystal exists only in this pre-thermalization state, and then eventually it goes, to, like at exponentially long times, it goes to the usual. Oh, yeah, so um, it's not that they see that, right? So, I mean, apparently they have huge trouble seeing equilibration for that model. And so, I mean, but this is second-hand information. So the way Tomas put it to me is that the numerical experts say that there is actually no good numerical evidence that this model actually thermalizes, right? So in these regions. But okay, I mean, um, I, I just take it, I, I just believe that it thermalizes and I'm just trying to bounce from below the, the time. Okay, so if there are no other questions, let's thank uh, Vitek for a really great talk.